The Lord be with you. Welcome to First Baptist Church. My name is Pastor Baird Owen, the senior pastor here at First Baptist. If you are a guest with us, special welcome to you. Uh, if you would like more information about our church or like for us to have more information about you, there are connect cards in the pew in front of you. You can fill that out and drop it in the offering plate and let that be your offering to us today. We can tell you all that's going on in the life of First Baptist. We do have a lot going on that we want you to be aware of. With Lent starting uh, this past week, uh, we are engaging in the ecumenical Lenten lunches that will be going on each week for the next five weeks leading up to Easter. And you can see the schedule in your bulletin. Uh, for those who may not know this, this is one of the big ecumenical ventures that we do throughout the year with area churches in downtown Waynesboro. And uh, we host at one, and then I'll speak at another, and we just that's just kind of what we do. And uh, if you have any questions about that, you do, we do need to put in reservations. So just let the church office know by tomorrow if you're interested uh, for that coming week, whatever Monday it is, and we will make sure you're signed up. Uh, save the date for March 16th. Uh, this happens every couple years. Uh, Pastor Larry is a part of the Virginia Baptist Mail Corral. And they tour through Virginia performing, and we will be hosting them March 16th at 7 p.m. Uh, this is uh, a wonderful night of worship, and uh, I think it was five years ago, the last time they were here, and it was just marvelous. Um, and we uh, will be hosting them again March 16th here in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. There is a lot, always a lot going on uh, in the life of the church. If you have questions or events coming up, times or dates, you can always contact the church office or check our website or social media, and uh, we want you to be as informed as possible. Uh, but that is not the intention of this hour. We are here to worship and experience the living Christ. So let us prepare our hearts as we go and meet God in this hour. Would you pray with me? God, our provider, we walked into church today to begin this Lytton journey, meeting you in different ways. Some of us need strength because we are facing a big challenge. Some of us need hope because we feel like giving up. Some of us need love because we are feeling alone. We trust that you will provide for us, whether through words or music or in a quiet moment of reflection. We know you are here. We know you are with us. Amen.
morning. Our church is affiliated with the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. And over the past couple of years, I've been able to get to know folks at the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship a little bit better. And I have to say that one of the things that I'm most impressed with the CBF is their ministry and outreach to refugees and immigrants. And that's what I want to tell you this morning during our mission moment. Actually, this is very relevant to our students in the youth group. Last year, we went to Atlanta, Georgia, and part of, part of that trip was going to the CBF headquarters, which is in Decatur, Georgia. And while we were at CBF, uh, just learning more about what they do with students and the ministries to students, we had the opportunity to connect with someone who was working there in their office. And she said, hey, we were talking about immigration and refugees. She said, hey, there's this great little town like five minutes away called Clarkston, Georgia. It's known as the Ellis Island of the South. And it's like one of the most diverse cities in, in, in the state of Georgia and in the Southeast. And it's because it's where refugee resettlement agencies exist in the state of Georgia, right next to Atlanta. And she said, my husband works at this place called Refuge Coffee, and they, they're an intentional ministry for refugees to find a job, make a living wage, and uh, learn, learn you know, things we need to know to be uh, citizens of the United States. And so we went over with her to Clarkston, Georgia, and we were able to sit and have a cup of coffee with a, uh, with a refugee from, the, from Congo. And it was an amazing experience for our youth to sit at a table with someone who looked different from them, who spoke a different language from them, and who was able to teach them and tell them things that I think that they needed to hear. So CBF does not does some actually some really cool things uh, with, refu with refugee resettlement and education. Refugees, when they... Uh, they come to our country because of fear of persecution, oftentimes because of their religion or their ethnicity or their race. And so refugees always want to go back home. That's the desire to go back home, but they can't. And so CBF uh, leverages its resources to do a few things. And in particular, there is a ministry in Fort Worth, Texas that works with preschool kids to give them a leg up. The American school experience is scary for a preschooler who has just moved here, who arrived here, maybe unexpectedly, and is resettled in a place that they don't know. And so there is a church and a ministry there called Ready for School in Fort Worth, Texas, that has established a library and a center for preschool students to come and to get a leg up, to learn, to learn some English, to learn basic reading principles that you would typically get as a kid here in the United States, and to prepare them for school. And so this is our mission moment this morning. And this is what the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship is doing, and this is where part of our offering goes. A reading from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit, they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. The word of God for the people of God. Be to God. Let's pray together. Almighty God, create in each of us a kneeling place where we may empty ourselves of our self-importance and, be, and become vulnerable to your word to us. Help us to set our faces firmly against friendly suggestions for safe and expedient lives and turn toward the risk of discipleship. 
Loosen our grip on certainties that smother possibilities. Forgive our resistance to change. Let us pursue the adventure of losing our lives in order to find them in you. Guide us as we follow the way of the cross, where despair is transformed by the promise of new life, and where we are compelled to intercede for those who have more pain in their lives than hope. When we are too be eager to be better than, when we are too rushed to care, when we are too tired to bother, when we are too preoccupied to listen, when we are too quick to act from motives other than compassion, transform us. Hold our feet in the fire of your Lenten grace so we can see our actions in the light of your costly love. Amen.
Our sermon lesson comes from the book of Romans. Over the course of Lent, we will be in chapters 5 through 8. And this may be some of, if not Paul's, most important section of work. It is definitely one of his most theological. I'm going to read verses just 1 through 8. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into the hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us, in that while we still were sinners... Christ died for us.
The season of Lent can feel dark, but the season of Easter is light. But you can't get to the light unless you first go through the dark. Romans 5.8 agrees. God proves his love for us. The light. While we were still sinners, Christ dies for us. The dark. There is so much detail about the death of Jesus bound up in the four Gospels. But here in Romans, Paul has boiled down the death of Jesus into just one sentence. But it is a massively important sentence. God proves his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ dies for us. Now, just about every sentence in Romans 5 through 8 is important. And these are chapters that we're going to explore during the Lenten journey. But this one sentence, it grabs me because it shows what we inherently know to be true. That Jesus dies proving God's love to humanity. Bringing our sins into the light. And giving us a path to overcome them. And all of this is enormously important. Especially for the season of Lent. So let me explain. The thing about Christianity that strikes me as the most profound is it is one about descent more than ascent. Jesus came into the world and humbled himself. He could have built an army, but he blessed the meek. He could have risen to political power, but he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, we often think that our job as Christians is to ascend, to become bigger than ourselves, to garner acclaim or praise, to climb our way to God's good graces. This path of ascent, it says, if we do the right things, say the right prayers, climb the ladder of morality, then we can achieve spiritual success. Now, we may not be cognizant of this, but this is the trap that just about every church and every Christian everywhere falls into. We think if we say the right things, if we act a certain way, that God will bless us more as a person, as if our production is what equates our worth. This path of ascent, it assumes that our faith is contingent on our influences. So we pour our time and attention into doing more, achieving more, and everyone does this, whether you're aware of it or not. But this is unequivocally sin. It is straight ego that says we can climb our way to God. Think Tower of Babel. We all do it. When we fall into this trap, we start assuming that our actions or our belief system, that what we invest in intellectually as a Christian is what fuels our spiritual growth. Just come and ascend with me and we'll experience more of God's good graces. But this is backwards. It's backwards for church and it's backwards for individuals. What the season of Lent reminds us is that it is a more spiritual path to descend than ascend. You don't climb your way to God. You fall into God's grace. So much of what happens on earth cannot be fixed and it cannot even be explained. But it can be felt. It can be suffered. The global spread of the coronavirus, the Milwaukee mass shooting four days ago at Molson Coors, volcano eruptions in Japan and the Philippines and Alaska already in 2020. These events can't be explained in a way that solves them. There's no achievable solution that remedies the pain of what's already occurred. But we can feel these tragedies. We can suffer along with those who suffer. We can enter into the pain, even if it's not even our pain. And we can carry the burden that those who suffer bear. Real, authentic Christianity 
understands that we must, just like we see with the death of Jesus, we must agree to feel. We have to agree to descend into. We have to agree to suffer the pains of others. To do this, we have to become less, not more, less rigid, less controlling, less self-seeking, not more. We must let go, become less materialistic, less comfortable, less ignorant. We have to shed the egoic mind that markets a false sense of self. What Lent reminds us is that our spiritual growth happens more by subtraction than it does addition. Descent over ascent actually leads us to God. I really love this. It feels backwards, but I love it. This Lenten season, we have to take a spiritual path of descent if we want to experience the depth of Easter. And what this means is we have to enter into suffering. We must descend into our own suffering, acknowledging that we are sinful. We have to admit our own pain, our own mistake-filled lives. We have to enter into our own tragedies that we can't avoid, but we can feel. We have to own up to the fact that we're not perfect. We're never going to be perfect. God never expects us to be perfect, and that's completely okay. And when we do this, when we acknowledge both our shortfalls and our pitfalls, when we come to terms with them, when we descend into ourselves, our past, something amazing happens. This is what Paul teaches us in Romans 5. So I want to read it slowly. I'll pause a few times. These verses are so important. We'll start in verse 1. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. Verse 1 matters. Everyone in this room, no exceptions, has peace with God through Jesus Christ. We obtained God's grace not because of our own works, but because of Jesus Christ. Verse 2, and we can boast in our hope and in the sharing of the glory of God. And not only that, we can boast in our sufferings. Now this matters too. Just because we have God's grace doesn't mean we're going to be free from suffering. It doesn't work that way. Bad things still happen. There are wars and disease and heartbreaks and job losses and deaths of loved ones. Pain still exists. It's the common denominator of all of life. But we can hope in God even in the midst of our suffering. How? Well, that's what Paul teaches us next. The second half of verse 3. We can do this. By knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. A hope does not disappoint. Because God's love has been poured into the hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. And so this is it. This is the path of descent. This is the road map that we can all take. Suffering moves us inward and gives us endurance, which moves us further inward, which builds character, which moves us to the bottom of our soul. And that's where we find God's hope. Well, like I said, this path of descent matters so much. When we were in seminary, we had a special program that students could teach inmates at a nearby women's prison. They could actually, the inmates, could get a certificate in theological studies if they went through the whole program, and a lot of the women did. The program was such a success that the prison would let the women take a trip to our campus and to worship with us. And they would lead us in worship as the choir. 
And then a few of them would offer testimonies in between their songs. Every one of them, every single inmate, understood the power of God's forgiveness. And the way that they could access God's forgiveness was they had to go inward, into their own inner anguish, and they had to learn to forgive themselves. But then they would also have group work where they would sit in circles, talk about their feelings and their experiences and what they're wrestling with emotionally and internally and spiritually. And they had to learn to hold each other's pain too. And they had to learn to forgive one another. There wasn't a dry eye in the room the day they led worship for us because we were watching 30 women who had no freedom sing about the spiritual freedom that they found in Christ. And they could do it because of verse 6. For while we are still weak, at the right time, Christ dies for the ungodly. And here, we see that it is Christ who takes the path of descent first, showing us how we can get access to God. Christ saw our weakness as humans. Christ could feel our sin. And Christ entered into that pain and suffered it unto death. Which brings up a huge point. The path of descent is not just an individual journey that connects our soul to our pains. Now it does do that. The path of descent allows us to go into our own soul and to bring healing to old wounds that we carry that the world doesn't know about. That's an enormous first step for connecting to God. But what the path of descent also does is it does the same thing that Jesus experiences. Not only does it connect us to our pain, but it connects us to the pain of others. The path of descent it leads us to empathy. There wasn't a dry eye in the room when we were watching 30 women inmates seeing amazing grace and then to explain how they felt their chains are gone because they were learning to enter into other people's suffering. We felt their freedom at that moment. Verse 7, Indeed, Rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. We, on our own, we live in sin. At our core, we will never do enough, achieve enough, become good enough to measure up to God. We can't save ourselves, but Christ can. And so Christ willingly descends to us, enters into our suffering, and saves us. Richard Rohr says that God shows love by becoming that which God loves, whatever it is. To show God's love of creation, God becomes creation. To show God's love for humanity, God becomes human. I really love this. Because if God loves us, then God becomes us. And sure enough, Jesus descends into our world, takes on our suffering. And through Jesus' death and resurrection, we all become reconciled to God. We become conscious of God. The path of descent is a path towards consciousness. So how do we go down it? Now I've alluded to it several times, but I want to try to be quite clear. This Lent, this Lenten season, we need to reverse our strategy. Life is not about more acclaim or more climbing or becoming greater. It's not about suffering less to achieve more. That quest is fueled by our ego. This Lent, we need to descend out of the ego and into our souls 
to reconnect to God. I mean, it's like moving from your head to your heart. This Lent, we need to fall out of the ego to re reconnect with God. And we can do this through repentance. We have to admit to ourselves and to God that we are sinful and we fail. And despite our best efforts, we can't avoid the pain of the world. Pain is just part of the deal. But we can learn to feel it. We can acknowledge that suffering is real. And to do this, we have to practice descending inward, connecting to our own inner anguish. Now, this sounds scary, and a lot of people think it is. But if you're willing to do it, it'll send you on a path that actually leads to endurance, which leads to building character, which leads to offering hope. And that hope, says Paul, never disappoints. And then you mysteriously, I don't know how this happens, it just does. When you do this path of descent, you start connecting to others, which births empathy and compassion towards one another and ourselves, which fosters solidarity with others who are suffering, which humbles all of us to stand before God and finally admit that God proves his love for us that while we are still sinners, Christ dies for us. Now I know this is heady. Paul is notorious for using logic. Every one of his letters to churches are very methodical, very logical. You usually need to take a few laps around it to read it multiple times to hold the argument that Paul is making. So I want to take one more lap at it, try to say it clearly. When we take the path of descent, we become crucified with Christ. We enter into our suffering as well as the suffering of others. But thanks to Christ's descent, suffering leads to endurance, which leads to character, which leads to hope, which leads to the unconditional grace of God. It may seem backwards, but in Christ, down is up. Less is more. Subtraction is really addition. Descent is beauty. Ascent is sin. This Lenten season is the perfect time for us to take the path of descent, to let go, to repent, to imitate Christ. And in so doing, we can find our true selves connected to both God and one another. I'll tell you one quick story. When I was moving from college to seminary, the summer before I made that transition, I got to be a middle school baseball coach for Brentwood Academy right outside of Nashville, Tennessee. It was the height of my professional career as a baseball player. To be able to coach these little, these little guys was amazing. We would run every single practice for conditioning, and we wanted to be the best conditioned team in our league. And every single time we ran, they would complain about it. And I remember specifically getting mad at the boys because they were complaining about running. You don't run for punishment. You run for conditioning because this is going to make us better. It's going to make every aspect of the game better if we're in shape to do it. And I remember this one kid just like getting so viscerally angry. Why do we have to always run? And I remember snapping back at him and saying, this suffering produces endurance. This kind of endurance will produce character. And if you have any hope of winning, you need to keep running. So I used Romans 5. I used it incorrectly, but I used it. And it was very beneficial at that moment because I sounded like I knew what I was talking about. In some ways, I was right. We are suffering in this together. As a coach, I would actually run with them, and the goal was always to beat me. And I wanted to enter into the pain that we were experiencing together. We were building something by enter in, entering into suffering together. We were building hope, hope that we could be a team, 
hope that we could take what we were learning and practice out onto the field and participate with one another. Baseball is a team sport. It takes trusting one another to accomplish our goals. And it's a very interesting connection that I feel between a group of people moving from point A to point B together and what Paul is describing for the church in Romans 5. As a church, we have to enter into our suffering together. We bear the load together, knowing that it was Christ that did it first and offers us a hope that will not disappoint. It would be a shame for you to miss an opportunity this Lenten season to enter into the dark suffering portions of your life because there's people around you that can help hold them. There is healing that can occur when you do, and that makes Easter all the more important. all of God's people said amen and amen as I said from the beginning Lent is dark but it we have to travel this darkness together because we're going to get to the light of Easter so I hope you'll take this Lenten journey seriously and with us over the next several weeks at this point in the service we're going to respond to this gift to this hope that God gives us in Romans if there's something on your heart you would like to speak with me about I'll be standing down front the altar is always open to come and pray would you join us as we respond to God's hope together?
pray. Almighty and loving God, we ask that you bless these tithes and offerings, that they will be a small tribute of our love to you and to the communities beyond, both here in Waynesboro and around this world. Amen.
receive this benediction. Depart now in peace, knowing the God of all creation is loving and gracing and redeeming you still. Go and pass the peace.